Hello everyone. I just watched a, a, a an old video. Uh, it's like eleven or twelve years, and it was <laughs> it was this guy uh, ranting and raving about. Well, he wasn't. He drove a truck, and some wood fell off the truck. And this reporter, this female reporter, came up to him, and she's just like, "Yeah, you know, you had some stuff." fall off and they called you back to go pick it up did you hear and he was just like yeah I must have been a woman I don't take orders from no woman I take orders from no woman <laughs> and then later on he goes they go when you didn't go back and clean it up he goes yeah it must have been a woman I just look back and say shut up <laughs> he's just you gotta say misogyny is alive and well on that man and I'm not saying it was right, but his accent and his hatred was certainly funny. Then he goes off on the deep end. Yeah, I move things for white people and black people, people from Russia, people from Jamaica, people from Ukraine, even men from Mars. And it was just like, okay, yeah, this guy's batshit insane. All right, so <laughs> just a daily reminder that there are some weird people out there. And it made me laugh. To re-listen to it. All right, I got to give a good hip injury. Hip injury, a hip itch. Okay, so this is part two of the Abbasid. Did I already pronounce that wrong? Abbasid Caliphate. Part two, and let's go. Which, because of it, everyone is moving to uh, civilization cities. Get rich. Its location and its caliphal patronage grew immensely quickly. Mosques, palaces, factories, libraries, hospitals even, all grew up in an extremely short amount of time. Interestingly, unlike any administrators of the former Umayyad regime, one of the masterminds behind it all may not have been born a Muslim. For he was Khalid the Barmakid, an immensely skilled civil servant descended from a hereditary family of Buddhists originating in the Balkh region of modern-day Afghanistan. Hmm. Today little more than ruins and rubble, Balkh was one of the great cities of late classical Asia. Encircled by a Cyclopean mud brick wall, the city had once been the capital of Greek Bactria after Alexander the Great's conquests. Later, it was ruled by the Kushans, an immensely powerful empire contemporary with Imperial Rome. The nearby Bamyan Buddhas, destroyed by the Taliban in 2001, once stood as testament to this time of Buddhist rule in Afghanistan. And prior to the Abbasid revolution of the mid 8th century, the Barmakids had been the guardians of a shrine here for generations. Now, recent converts to Islam, like thousands of others living in the eastern portion of the Caliphate, they'd thrown their lot in with the Abbasids just before the revolution and moved to Baghdad afterwards to make their fortunes, profiting immensely in the process. Khalid's aid was integral in the construction of Baghdad. Though his Persian heritage occasionally showed through, such as according to the historian Masudi, when he saved the ancient Sasanian capital of Tessiphon from being recycled to use in construction of the new city. Arguing that wouldn't it be better to leave it there as a monument to Abbasid greatness. That's interesting. I guess to kind of show that there was once a great society instead of knocking it down and I mean if it's there today that's that's remnants of you know that's history that's a great thing to especially what are we talking is that 900 years ago I don't I didn't catch that a thousand years ago 1200 I mean that's 
that's a that's a pretty cool thing. I mean, we don't have that here, so I shouldn't say that. Um, in Cahokia, we have the mounds from the Mississippian people. We have 80 of the 120 mounds left, but that was just earthen mounds a thousand years ago. Not as impressive, but you know, we've got that. And I say, I apologize, I say it's not as impressive because it's just mountains of earth, just dirt. Now it's grass on it and, and stuff. But it's not like a, a concrete or a clay or something like the, some kind of structure like that was. Baghdad soon called the city of peace with its immense circular walls and elaborate system of canals quickly became a Middle Eastern Venice. It would serve as inspiration for a slew of caliphal capitals to follow, most notably with Fatimid Cairo in the 10th century. Yet, the state was not always at peace. Like Rome during the height of the empire, the caliphate was pretty much constantly at war. The Abbasids had come to power on the backs of their allied cousins, who now suffered as a result. In 762, just as Baghdad was being built, a direct descendant of Muhammad rose up in the holy city of Medina with the support of other Alids. His brother soon rose up in Basra, and together they attempted to overthrow the new regime. Known as Muhammad the Pure Soul, this charismatic yet doomed Alid prince attempted to emulate his ancestor by raising his sword along the very same dikes and moat where Muhammad had made his stand just over a century earlier. Of course, he died in the battle, along with scores of other rebels from all walks of life. Brutal as he was. Interesting, I didn't... I didn't realize that. Well, I, I mean, I, I mean that I didn't realize that, uh, what am I trying to say? De the descendants, um, I guess I kind of thought they died off, the descendants of Muhammad died off relatively young. Oh, that's his children I'm thinking of. I think all but but one child, right? One daughter. That's what I'm thinking of. Cuz yeah, he had grandchildren and stuff like that. Okay. Brutal as he was, Al-Mansur was a great builder and skilled ruler, largely due to his tendency to promote by merit. Oh, his vizier okay. Raba, essentially the public face of the caliph ruled the court on his behalf. Whereas powerful dynasts like the Barmakids oversaw the actual administration of rule. That's the last cool. 12 years of Al-Mansur's reign between 763 and 775 were some of the most peaceful that the Muslims had experienced in generations. And when Al-Mansur died on the Hajj to Mecca in 775, despite no clear rules for succession having been established, his officials successfully stage-managed the potentially dangerous succession. In 775, seeing his son Al-Mahdi <clears throat> smoothly succeed him as the new caliph. Al-Mansur had played the role of the enforcer. His son Al-Mahdi portrayed himself as a spiritual figurehead. He seems to have taken more of a back seat than his father, and the state flourished. There were more Alid rebellions, such as that of Hussein ibn Ali, but these were made light work of by the Caliphal army. In 780, after returning from an expedition against the Byzantines with the young crown prince Harun, Khalid the Barmakid died. His son Yahya, however, had already cemented his position within the regime, and his influence over the young potential heir to the throne, Harun. In 785, 
having already named two heirs, Al Mahdi died, apparently in a hunting accident. Thus, for the first time, a succession crisis threatened to explode into civil war. Yahya found himself imprisoned by the new caliph. His fate, and potentially that of the other brother, Harun, looked grim. Though thankfully for the empire, which had still not established an effective method of succession, the caliph died soon afterwards, in mysterious circumstances, thus paving the way for the reign of the man often seen as the greatest of all Abbasid caliphs. In the midsummer of 802, an especially curious incident occurred at the Frankish Emperor Charlemagne's imperial court at Aachen. According to the Frankish scholar Einhard, as courtiers and regional magnates went about their business that day, they were stopped in their tracks as a solitary Asian elephant came thundering into view over the horizon. His name was Abul Abbas, and for many of those present, he must have seemed like a mythical beast from the far reaches of the earth. Along with his travelling companion, a Frankish Jew named Isaac, Abul Abbas had travelled across desert, mountain and ocean to arrive at Charlemagne's court. He was himself perhaps the most notable diplomatic nicety amongst a vast variety of goods brought for Charlemagne from the Abbasid Caliphate for both empires had a mutual enemy in the form of the breakaway Umayyad Emirate at Cordoba. Atop the back of the great beast came an exotic array of gifts and luxuries. Exotic silks from faraway China, expertly crafted metalwork made by Muslim artisans, perfumes from deepest Arabia, minerals from the four corners of the earth, Ivory chessmen made with material from deepest Africa, a colossal tent with multicoloured curtains, and perhaps most notably an ingeniously made water clock that marked the passing of time by automatically dropping bronze balls into a bowl. Each passing hour was greeted by a mechanical knight that emerged from a tiny door, which then shut behind him. The marvel was so impressive and so far ahead of anything that Western Europe could make at the time, that according to Einhard, many of those present simply took it for sorcery, beseeching <laughs> the emperor to have it destroyed so it could not corrupt his mind. Such was the technology of the Abbasid Caliphate in the early 9th century, under the rule of the caliph Harun al-Rashid, quite simply the most powerful ruler on earth. At the same time, another Frankish court writer, Notka the Stammerer, describes envoys regularly travelling back and forth between the two imperial courts, with Charlemagne sending his ally Spanish horses, colourful Frisian cloaks and impressive hunting dogs. Impressive these may have been, though in truth the items sent with Abul Abbas far outweigh those sent by the Franks. He himself spent many years at Charlemagne's menagerie before dying somewhere in northern Germany, with the very slight possibility that he was utilised very briefly as a war elephant in a campaign against the Danes. In the decades and centuries that followed, such was the importance of the diplomatic gifts sent by the Abbasids to Charlemagne, that in the view of many scholars, they had a lasting influence on Carolingian art. Yet, Western Europe isn't the only place we find gifts being sent by Harun. At the same time as Abul Abbas entered Europe, another Abbasid alliance was brokered. This one with Tang China, on the opposite side of Eurasia. Like the Umayyad threat on his far western periphery, Harun was of course looking out for his own concerns, specifically the mountain kingdoms of Tibet. 
which threatened his far eastern lands. Known as Arlun in the Tang sources, perhaps Harun sent a similar diplomatic mission to China in order to get them on side against this common foe. These missions to the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans a testament to the continent-spanning trade network and diplomatic ties cultivated by his empire. Usually held up as the greatest of all Abbasid caliphs, in the 1200 years since his reign, Harun al-Rashid has certainly captivated the hearts and minds of Muslims and non-Muslims alike the world over. In the 19th century, he was called the Golden Prime, and the splendour of his court made famous in Europe by the likes of William Butler Yeats and Alfred Tennyson. The reason for his popularity, however, were the tales recorded in the Persian epic, The Arabian Nights. The story of the mythical Persian Sassanid King of Kings, Shariar, who is told stories by his wife, Shahrazad, in order to delay him from killing her eventually changing his view on life in the process because of the stories she told and ultimately saving her life. Huh. These tales, including the basis for Aladdin and Sinbad, some of them perhaps originating in India, aren't strictly historical, actually dating from the later Middle Ages. Yet, many of them are based on stories that date back hundreds of years to the time of the early Abbasids. It was during that era that some of the greatest Arabic poets of all time were writing. Men such as Abu Nawas and Abul Atayua to name a few. And poetry itself was admired like never before, perhaps only rivaled by ancient Greece. Thus, the Arabian Nights provide a fascinating glimpse into the Caliphate at the very height of its power, as imagined by future generations. In many of the stories, Harun, often portrayed as a symbol of firm but fair justice, wanders the streets incognito at night to see how the common people lived and what their views on life were, accompanied only by his vizier Jafar the Barmakid and his executioner Masrur. For most Muslims, this was the greatest age for Islam. Yet, precisely because of the Arabian Nights tales, the historical Harun al-Rashid fairly quickly turned into a legendary figure after his death. To some extent, this reputation was the product of the disasters which followed his reign, leading to it being looked back on as a golden age. Golden as it was, Harun's reign was an age of contrasts incredibly violent by modern standards, the very same Jafar he wandered the streets with eventually being executed on a whim. Though it was certainly a high point for culture and scientific achievement, Harun's reign also saw the beginning of the political disintegration of the Islamic Caliphate, which had been mostly unified since Muhammad's death in 632. Yet it was also. I'm gonna go back a couple seconds. Not too far. Right there. It's right after Muhammad's death. And we will pick it up there for part three. There's a lot of names that I just I've never heard of. Like this guy. I don't know who this guy is. All right, 570 to 632. I always get dates mixed up. I forget. So uh, Islam has been around for 1,400 years. But for some reason in my mind, I think Muhammad was born in the 1400s. And so I, I always get it. it. It's just one of those things. <laughs> so I always, I'm like, that's not right. That's not right. 
And then I, I have, I've made that mistake several times and people are like, no, and, and they get corrected. And you'd think I'd learn, but apparently I don't. 570 to 632, I gotta, I gotta just mentally burn that into my, my memory. Mohammed, I always spell it M-U-H-A-M-M-E-D. Muhammad. Mohammed. Okay, so I'm spelling it wrong. How come you guys aren't correcting me on that? Okay, well look, if you want to donate to the channel, uh, there's a thanks button. I don't know, I can change the amount and all that. I haven't done anything. Appreciate the people who have donated. Um, but if you want to donate to the channel, any bit helps, supports me greatly, makes me want to continue going. Um, if not, I'm going to continue to make videos, so no harm, no foul. Um, if you don't want to donate, it would be great if you could subscribe, give a thumbs up, that helps. Um, and if you don't want to do that, then, I don't know, have a good day, have a good night. <laughs>